Hello and good morning everyone and welcome to Balance of Biodiversity. My name is Katie and I'm a science communicator from Cambridge Science Centre. Um, the video you're going to be seeing today is part of our virtual school trip series. These were a series started in lockdown where we basically filmed some of our shows that could be sent out to schools so they could have a trip to the centre experience even when they couldn't come and visit. We are still continuing these now though um, and this is a fairly new one of ours, Balance of Biodiversity. This session will run, we'll show the video, which is about half an hour long, and then there will be time for a Q&A afterwards. You can start submitting your questions at any point, so please feel free to submit your questions while the show is running. Um, and afterwards, I will be very happy to answer your questions. Now I will let the events team start the video. Thank you. From our local park, to forests, to the sea. Different living things can be seen everywhere. Brightly coloured flowers, tall trees, tiny insects and so much more. There is a great variety of life on planet Earth. But we as humans have an impact on the world around us and it is important we look after nature and the living things found there. The land can be changed to another type of environment, one that looks very different to the green and colourful spaces we can see. And this change can affect us all. So how do we want our earth to look and what can be done to help bring nature back? Hi, my name is Katie and welcome to Cambridge Science Centre's virtual school trip show, Balance in Biodiversity. All around us are living things, trees, flowers, insects, all the way to us. These living things exist in a community where everything in nature is connected, including both the living things and the non-living things, like the air or rain. When we look at all of these and how they interact, this is an ecosystem. It is the community formed between living things and where they are found, their habitat. And an ecosystem isn't just one size. They can be as big as a national park, your garden, or even as small as a tiny garden pond. But let's think about what you might find in an ecosystem and all those living things you might be able to spot. It would be far too complicated if every living thing was just one big group. And so instead we sort them. This is called classification and you can see the classification chart on the screen. As we work downwards, the groups will get more and more specific. And so we are going to focus on this by looking at us, human beings. The first level is domain and ours is called eukarya and then our kingdom is animal. Any creature that is able to move on its own is classed as an animal. The groups will then continue to get more and more specific as we work down. The next level is chordates which are animals with a backbone. They're mammals which are chordates with fur or hair and milk glands. The order is primates which are mammals with collarbones and grasping fingers, and then hominids, which are primates with relatively flat faces and 3D vision. Then we come to the genus, which is Homo. These are hominids with an upright posture and large brains. And the last part is the species name. And for humans, this is sapien. This means creatures from the genus Homo with a high forehead, well-developed chin and thick skull bones. And this describes us as human beings. So as you can see, classification is all based on similarities. And as it continues all the way down, living things get more and more similar in each group at each level. We finished with species, the most specific group. And these are organisms that share similar characteristics and that can produce offspring that can breed. So they can have children which can go on to have their own children. 
So by using this system, we've been able to group different living things into their species. So how might they interact with each other and coexist in different types of environment? There is such a wide variety of different species all over the world, but how do they live alongside each other and coexist in different types of environment? Some ecosystems will have lots of different species living in them, whereas others have very few. One was full of life, plants and creatures, but the other was a lot more grey and quiet. There is an important term used for the variety of species that there are in a location. This is called biodiversity. The more species there are in a specific location, the higher the biodiversity is there. And if there are very few species, there is low biodiversity. There are lots of different ecosystems across the world, with forests, lakes and your town all having different levels of biodiversity. Within each ecosystem, whether they have high or low biodiversity, the different plants and animals that exist there will interact with each other. And these living things need energy or food to survive, and they will get this from other species in the area. This creates a food chain. To get a food chain going, we will need something to start it off. But this is a bit different, as it isn't a species of living thing, and in a lot of cases, it isn't even something that is on the Earth. In fact, it is around 148 million kilometres away. It is the Sun. Our star that gives us light to see also provides the energy needed to kickstart a food chain. This is by providing plants and some creatures with energy through a process called photosynthesis. This allows the plant to use the light from the sun to create energy to help them survive. And this is very important, as plants not only help make oxygen, which we need to breathe, but they are also food for lots of different creatures. So starting with a plant, for example, an oak tree, which will start off the food chain. The oak tree is called a producer because it can make its own energy from the sun and starts the flow of energy down the chain. The leaves on the tree can be eaten by a caterpillar and that caterpillar may be eaten by a shrew. Then the shrew can then be eaten by an owl. The owl is at the top of the food chain, meaning no other animal will be eating it. This pathway of energy creates a simple food chain as well as simple interactions between these creatures found in a habitat. Because the rest of the creatures in this food chain need to consume other living things to get the energy, they are called consumers. We can represent this using these Jenga blocks, with each block representing a different species. At the base of our Jenga tower will be the oak tree. Then resting above this will be the caterpillar as it relies on the tree for food. Then next we have the shrew. And then finally, the tower is topped off with the barn owl. You can see how each creature relies on the creature below it in the food chain. Now we mentioned earlier that the sun provides energy to the start of the food chain, but that isn't the only way. When creatures die, they are decomposed, so broken down, by living things called decomposers. An example of these are fungi. These help return energy to the beginning of the food chain. Let's take our owl, for example. When that dies, decomposers can help break it down into minerals that plants can then use to grow. But this food chain here is very simple, and most ecosystems don't have such simple relationships as this. Instead, a way to build a more accurate picture is to build a food web, which shows all the possible sources for food for different living things in an ecosystem. So let's think about the food chain we made, but this time includes some of the species that may live in the same habitat. So now we have created a more complicated and interconnected relationship between the species in an ecosystem. And this is much more similar to how a full ecosystem would be. 
We can see this in our Jenga blocks and the far more complex tower we have built with species relying on multiple other living things for food. Now, all creatures in a food web are important, as we've seen in our Jenga towers, as each species relies on the ones below them in the food web. So if one disappears or dies out, that food source is no longer there and this disrupts the food web. But we are going to take a look at a couple of specific living things that do very important jobs in an ecosystem. These will be our ecosystem heroes. Remember the decomposers from earlier? Well, our first hero is one of these. It's fungi. There are lots of types of fungi and they can look quite different. You may have seen some growing as it can be found in a lot of places, from gardens to woodland and even on mountains. And it appears in lots of different forms. This hero plays a very important part in an ecosystem by breaking down dead matter. This is animals that have died or plants that are now rotting. The fungi uses this matter and turns it into nutrients that plants can use to help them grow. Essentially, these ecosystem heroes recycle and help return valuable resources to the plants back at the beginning of the food webs. But they aren't the only ecosystem heroes. You may have seen another buzzing around. Yes, it is in fact bees. Bees are insects that do a very important job. In fact, without them, plants may not be able to reproduce as effectively, growing crops may be affected, and there could be an effect on all the animals that rely on certain plants for food, including us. Simply put, bees are very important for survival. This is because they are responsible for pollination. Pollination is the process that allows plants to reproduce and create new plants. To get an idea of just how bees are able to do this, we first need to take a look at the parts of a flower, as these are very important when generating seeds to create new flowers. We have here a lily, and we are going to take a look at the most important parts of this flower for pollination. Now around the outside of the lily and the part we see the most of are the petals. These are pretty and they do play a part in attracting pollinators like bees, but they are not the most important area of the flower to help us learn about pollination. So we can remove these. This leaves us with the parts from the middle of the flower. This here is the stamen and at the top is the anther where a very important powdery substance, pollen, can be found, which is vital for pollination. This pollen has a very strong color and can clearly be seen when exposed. Sometimes though, when the flower is still growing, this is hidden away inside the anther, which is the case with this flower. We can take the anther off this lily and cut it open to reveal the pollen inside. This pollen also has a special shape, which helps the pollen grains be picked up by the bees and other pollinators. So now we'll take away the rest of the stamen. We are now left with the pistil, and at the top of this is the part called the stigma. This is where pollen has to reach in order for pollination to occur. So if we were to cut open the stigma, you'll be able to see the chamber with a path or tube leading down the style, which is this stem part, which you can see when this is also cut open. So if we cut open the stigma, you can see a chamber with a tube leading down the style, which is the stem section. The chamber is very important. And when pollen reaches the stigma, it can then travel down the style to this part here, the ovary. This is where the seeds to grow into new plants will begin their journey. So, as we saw, pollen has to be able to reach the stigma in the center of the flower. And it is here where pollinators come in. Bees help move the pollen. Flowers are brightly colored to attract bees 
and usually also have a scent that bees will pick up and want to explore. Bees will come to the flower to collect nectar, a sweet liquid which is perfect food for the insects. This is found quite low down in the flower, and while the bees are on the flower, the pollen from the anthers sticks to them. When the bees then travel to a different flower for more nectar, the pollen rubs off onto the stigma of the flower. Travelling down the style and into the ovary, seeds can now be made for new plants. Bees can help pollinate lots of different species of plants, and this helps create meadows full of flowers and helps protect woodland ecosystems. Not only that though, this pollination is also important for species of plants that we eat for food, including fruit and vegetables, with bees being able to pollinate 70 different types of crops. Bees aren't the only insects that are pollinators though. Some others are butterflies, moths and wasps. But bees are still very important to have around and so we need to make sure we protect these vital insects. So bees and fungi are two very important ecosystem heroes and help maintain ecosystems and biodiversity. But they aren't the only things having an effect. What else can impact how diverse a habitat is. Biodiversity can be put under risk if habitats change or if organisms from that habitat disappear. The less biodiverse a habitat is, the more at risk it is. For example, there is a forest full of elm trees. There are lots of trees in the forest, but very little variation between them as they are all elm trees. This means there is low biodiversity. A disease called Dutch elm disease, which only affects the elm trees, sweeps across this forest, infecting the whole area. This disease would kill most of the forest, and this means the animals and plants that rely on the trees would also be wiped out. But what if our forest had a range of trees, some elm trees, but lots of other different species too? There is a lot of variation and therefore higher biodiversity. When Dutch elm disease sweeps across the forest this time, the elm trees would be killed, but a lot more trees would remain. The forest would survive. Let's take a look at our Jenga towers, very similar to the ones you built earlier, with each block representing a different species. This one, doesn't have many different blocks, so few species and low biodiversity. But compare this to this one, which has many more blocks representing a wider variety of species and therefore greater biodiversity. We are going to look at how each of these towers responds to a loss of one of its species. So that means we need to take out a block from each tower. So I will now remove the oak tree from this tower. So as you can see, our less diverse tower has collapsed, as when we remove such a dominant species that so many others relied on, there is a big effect on what is left behind. So now I will take out the oak tree from our more biodiverse tower. So for our other tower, although it may not be quite as stable as it was before, the tower is still standing. There are enough species left behind to keep the other blocks standing up and support them. The species variation was vital for survival. But although a more diverse ecosystem is stronger and more likely to survive, it doesn't mean it's completely safe. Habitats can change drastically, for example, because of deforestation, where a wide area of trees are cleared. And this can affect a very diverse habitat as it takes away vital parts of the ecosystem. So let's think about our surviving tower. Although it could survive the loss of one species, this would be very different if vital parts of the ecosystem were removed. Let's say the forest undergoes deforestation and all the trees are chopped down. This layer of the tower representing the different types of trees will need to be removed. So let's remove those and see what happens. And the rest of the tower has collapsed. The ecosystem 
is destroyed. A lot of natural areas in the UK no longer exist because of habitats drastically changing for a variety of reasons, such as farming or to allow for land to be turned into towns and cities. This can have a bad effect on lots of species in the country, creating something called a species decline. As habitats are disappearing, so are the creatures that rely on them to get food, to grow and to reproduce, which lowers biodiversity. Some big causes of this is due to land being deforested, used for farming or agriculture and overfishing. Well, this is a quarry, a large pit used to find stone and other types of material. There aren't that many of these around the country, but they do still change natural habitats. They are essential, however, to collect materials like sand and gravel, which are used to create and build important parts of our way of life, such as schools, hospitals, roads and homes that we all rely on. These materials are usually found outside of towns or cities, and so that's why these quarries are created in the countryside. So let's take a look at one of these sites and see what can be done to help bring wildlife and biodiversity back to the area. Welcome to Lackford Lakes, a nature reserve run by the Suffolk Wildlife Trust. This site actually used to be a quarry run by a company called Semex, and they have a biodiversity action plan to help restore old quarry sites and reduce their impact, bringing more biodiversity to the location than at the land before the quarry. Once small areas of the quarry are finished being used to find material, they begin to restore it. And once the whole quarry has been closed, the site is turned into a natural area, sometimes a new nature reserve like this one. And this aims to restore the site to a habitat for many different species, helping improve the biodiversity of the area. By working with the Suffolk Wildlife Trust, Semex have been able to transform this site back to an area full of diverse plants and wildlife. We are joined by Sophie Mays, who is the Wild Learning Officer here at Lackford Lakes. What can you tell us about this nature reserve, Sophie? So Lackford Lakes is made up of lots of different habitats. Um, we've got 10 lakes on site and we also have meadows, we've got our woods and also our Breckland areas as well. In fact, we're a site of special scientific interest, which means we've got 19 species of dragonfly and lots of different species of bird. In fact, most people tend to come here for the kingfishers, um, but we also have starlings, nightingales, birds of prey, such as marsh harrier, buzzards. Um, so lots and lots going on in the site, so lots of diversity. In fact we've got an activity if you'd like to come and join us right now and um, to show you the diversity in some of our ponds. So we're here at the raised pond and I'm going to show you how to do some pond dipping safely not just for you but also for the creatures that are in this pond. So you're going to need a few things. You're going to need a net, a tray, something to have a look at your creatures and also something to identify them with as well and a spoon. So you're going to take your net and you're going to place it into the water and you're going to do what we call a figure of eight. So that's a number eight within the water. So you want to do it one or two times and then bring it up, take it in, give it a little shake and turn it over into your tray. So when you put it into the water, give it a little swish. That makes sure that all the creatures are off the net because we don't want any of them staying on here then we can have a look at what's in our tray. You take your viewer, now you might just have a pot at home, which is absolutely fine, and you're going to take your spoon, you're going to take some water and place it into your viewer. You can then select a creature. You want to be really gentle with the spoon and then you can put the lid back on. And then you can take a look through the top. So when you put it into the water, give it a little swish. That makes sure that all the creatures are off the net because we don't want any of them staying on here. So there's a large variety in here at the moment. Um, we've got our pond snail just here. And then just in comparison to that one, we have a ram's horn snail. So the ram's horn snail um, is sort of like curled up like the ram's horn on a sheep's head. And then the pond snails, they look a little bit like ice cream cones. So that's how we know the difference. And um, these guys are herbivores, so they're going to eat lots of the um, algae and also the plants and things in there. There are lots of ghost midge larvae in here so that's all these kind of see-through wiggly things all right and these are right down the bottom of our food chain they're actually going to become little flies 
and eventually um, they will actually leave the pond but these will be um, food for everything that's a little bit bigger. Now this one <laughs> that is whizzing around in here this is a whirly gig beetle so that's the one that's moving extremely fast um, on top and often you can actually see them whizzing around on top of the pond um, which is how we actually saw this one moving around um, it's not a predator this one um, will actually just eat again plants and things like that but obviously it moves very quick <laughs> because it doesn't want to get eaten so um, that's one of the ways that one's adapted this is our dragonfly nymph and we've got another few ones that are smaller and um, they will climb out of the pond eventually and they will become dragonflies so dragonflies can live underneath the water anywhere up to about seven years depending on species um, and then when they come out of the water it's normally anywhere sort of up to four months so they live most of their life underneath the water the main reason they come out just like anything else is to be able to mate you've also got some other nymphs so anything with a jointed leg is called a nymph and anything that's kind of wiggly is what we call larvae or larva there's a mayfly nymph just in one of its last stages of molting so they go darker um, before they molt and you've got another one just over here um, and they will again live under the water um, for a couple of years and then they'll come out and it's normally for the mayfly um, only about 24 hours that they actually live outside of the pond and that's because they don't have any mouth parts when they come out the pond um, so that adult stage is purely for breeding and laying eggs. So we've also got this little one. I've only seen one of them in here at the moment. And this is the great diving beetle larva. Um, now he's actually quite a ferocious predator. I don't mind putting my finger in here at the moment. I'm gonna watch it with this one because they will give you a nip. They've got two little pincers right at the front. And what they do is they then will take those pincers and they will grab hold of something that they want to eat and they inject it um, with this liquid that basically turns the inside to strawberry milkshake <laughs> and liquefies it and they suck it all out. And then you've also got our back swimmers, which do the same thing. So these guys have evolved um, to swim on their backs. And again, they will come up from underneath. They will grab hold of whatever they want to eat, inject their um, sort of mouth parts into it, and um, again, suck all the insides out. So that's why you often find lots of husks. So once you've finished your pond dipping and you've looked at everything that you want to in your tray, you need to make sure that you return them to the water safely. So you do that by taking your tray, taking it over to the water and gently lowering it in. So you don't pour it from a height. There we go. And then it's always important to make sure we give this a little bit of a swish. So we pour some water around and things like our snails, they might need a little extra helping hand. There we go. And that's everything back safely. Thank you, Sophie, for showing us around this site and for showing us how to pond dip. And as you saw, this nature reserve is full of different species and different wildlife, making this a very biodiverse area. And areas like this are vital to keep species numbers up and avoid more species becoming endangered. And it's not just here. Quarry sites across the country are being regenerated, taking sites from this to this. Remember our collapsed Jenga tower from earlier? Well, these regeneration efforts are helping to rebuild that. Habitats are being introduced, including woodland, grassland, lakes, and this is helping to build the foundations and the lower layers of an ecosystem. This helps more creatures live here and use this as their habitat. Our tower can be rebuilt and look similar to how it was before. And it's important these areas can support a wide variety of species and have high biodiversity. Because as we saw earlier, the more variety of life there is, the stronger the ecosystem is. The regeneration of this site and others like it is a great step to bring more biodiversity back to the country. By working together, Semex and the Suffolk Wildlife Trust have been able to create this nature reserve. However, projects like these do take a large team of people and big organisations. So although individually we may not be able to create something as big as this, we can all still do small things to help nature in our local area thrive. So thinking back to what we have learnt, 
We want to make sure living things have an environment that allows them to thrive and keeps biodiversity high. We also mentioned some vital creatures of an ecosystem, including bees, which need a safe habitat so they can carry on pollinating crops and plants. So what are some small things that we can all do to help both biodiversity and to help these ecosystem heroes? First, let's think about bees. Different types of bees live in different places. Honeybees, for example, live in hives, which might be managed by beekeepers. You may have seen some beekeepers yourself, dressed in their protective suit, gloves, and with the veil covering their face. But not all bees have these hives to live in. Instead, bumblebees and solitary bees live in nests, and it is these bees that we can do our part to help out. Bumblebee numbers are dropping, so any way that we can help is good. One thing these bees need is to be able to find food, which is that nectar from plants we mentioned earlier. By making sure we have a variety of flowers in our garden, or even in a small flower pot outside or on our windowsills, we can give the bees a helping hand. Some good flowers include carnations, daisies, daffodils, peonies and sunflowers, and many more. And these flowers don't just help bees. By having a wide range of plants in your garden or school fields or playgrounds, you can help provide habitats for different types of insects and other wildlife. For example, some flowering trees or shrubs can make a great habitat for different birds. And another way to help birds is by having bird feeders filled with food like small seeds, sunflower seeds or granules of peanuts. These feeders will help provide birds in the area with more food which is a vital part of any ecosystem. There are lots more small things we can all be doing, but I hope these have given you some ideas of ways that we can help. Why not see if you can find out any other things that you can do to help biodiversity? So let's think about our Jenga tower. By looking at what makes up an ecosystem and food chains and food webs, you've seen it get built up and you know what helps make it strongest a biodiverse ecosystem with lots of different species. But even the strongest towers can collapse, and when habitats are destroyed, this affects the ecosystem, and those areas with strong biodiversity can disappear. We have seen how it can be restored though, through big changes like Lackford Lakes, or little things that we can do in our own gardens, biodiversity can be increased, and the Jenga tower can be rebuilt. So next time you are outside, why not think about the biodiversity near you and see how much variation you can spot and maybe try out a way to help nature in your own garden or your local area. Thank you very much for watching. Bye. Hi everyone, um, I really hope you enjoyed the video um, and thank you for starting to submit questions and um, feel free to keep submitting questions as the Q&A goes on um, and I will start to answer a few that have come in. So the first question we had was, is the lily pollination you describe an example of parthenogenesis? Presumably cross-pollination is the driver for diversity and that's completely right. Plants will always strive for cross-pollination as the more diverse genetically plants are, hopefully the stronger they are to survive. So lilies are the same, they would strive for cross-pollination rather than self-pollination. And there are different ways plants do this, including lilies. Um, so one way is different maturity of the male and female parts of the flower, so the anther and then the stamen and the pistil, they'll all mature at different stages. Um, and this means that when one is mature, the other isn't, so they'll need the pollen from another flower to enter the ovary. The other technique is different heights. So if the anther is quite a lot higher, it can avoid self-pollination. They're the two main ways um, that plants will avoid self-pollination um, and hopefully cross-pollination will occur more frequently and this will help with diversity. Okay, so the second question is a kind of similar idea, which is, is the biodiversity in the human population and other animals important in infection resistance? 
Um, and again, the answer to this is definitely yes. Um, it's definitely important to have diverse biodiversity, both in us and in other animals. Um, we all know that when we get ill, we, know, we don't all get ill in the same way. We've all seen over the past year or so how affect how much you see that, how some creatures will definitely get ill more, and they'll get more ill than others from the same disease. So by having diversity, it can definitely help. If we were all genetically the same, things may affect us in a very similar way. And this runs the risk of kind of mass effect on populations. And that's why it's very important that um, lots of creatures have very wide genetic diversity. Some will have more than others. So there is less genetic diversity in humans than in all chimps. But we do all have genetic diversity and it is very important when we're fighting infection. Okay. So another good question was how can we tell which are the crucial species to conserve or do we just let nature find its own way? And it is a really good question and it isn't an easy one to answer. Um, there are different ways they judge which species to be conserved. Um, there's a term which is con conservational triage. So in the same way when you're judging, if you're in a triage situation in a medical scenario, there'll be some creatures you, or some people you tend to quicker than others because they're, they're more, their situation is more vital at that moment. It's a similar thing with creatures and they're all determined in different ways. So there are some which may not be of our priority list. So say, for example, the mosquito that causes malaria, it's not going to be at the top of the list for conservation because of the effect it can have on us. Whereas there are other animals or creatures which are higher up on the list. This could just be through observing their numbers over the years, especially it's more occurrent to us when it's something humans have caused. So for example, hunters, when they're hunting different creatures, we're more aware of when those numbers are dropping because they've been more tracked over the years. And this is ones where there's kind of more focus on keeping them and getting rid of the practices that harm them. These are things like lions or tigers that have been hunted. And it also depends on how much they can get us who want to help them. Um, so there are like charities will often focus on things like pandas or tigers. Um, and this helps create money and more people are more willing to donate to some of these creatures. But there are also kind of keystone species which are more important to ecosystems. And these are judged on how, you can kind of get a judge of maybe how well these contribute to the ecosystem, for, for example, fungi. And sometimes in these charities, it can be a general fundraising kind of charity. Um, and this can definitely the money raised by having these big kind of lions, tigers um, at the forefront will actually be used across species. So it's not just all about those main ones, but it's definitely the balance between how much kind of we are willing to, the balance between getting people to want to conserve the creatures, but also determining which ones are very important for the ecosystem. Okay. The next question, question five, um, or question four, I think we're on now. Um, would it be preferable not to quarry in the first place and le leave wildlife to survive? Now, obviously this would be the preferable option. If we could get the resources we needed without quarrying, um, it would be beneficial. But unfortunately, in order to build things that we need for our way of life, like roads, homes, um, hospitals and schools, we do need that kind of the materials you will get from quarrying. So unfortunately it is something that is necessary, um, especially as we've seen the population increase, they do, everyone needs somewhere to live. Um, so as the population increases, there is going to be more demand for houses and schools and so on and so forth. And this does create that demand for those materials. So that's why it's so important that if we are using those materials, we figure out a way to help afterwards. So it's kind of a cost benefit analysis, like what do we class as more important? And it's been determined a lot of the time that we need to get the resources we need for us. Um, so that's why it's so important that once we've built those things and use the quarry, that we return it back to its old state. 
And that's why we've seen in those kind of, when we saw at Lackford Lakes, when I visited Lackford Lakes, the difference it's made. That site was a quarry and they basically took it back to its bare bones and it drastically reduced the biodiversity at that site. There was a lot less biodiversity. But by regenerating it afterwards, they have been able to actually bring more biodiversity back to the area than there was before the quarry was even created. But this just means that although we've had to use that site to generate important materials, it is actually bringing back more biodiversity. So it's that balance of using what we need, but then making sure we return the area back to an area full of nature and full of wildlife to reduce the cost as much as possible. Okay. So next question, what creatures feed on fungi? So actually quite a lot do, and um, there's a lot of different creatures that feed on fungi. So you'll find birds and little um, rodents, quite a lot do. Um, there are different types of, because mushrooms are a type of fungi and we eat mushrooms. There are a lot of creatures that do. Obviously there are some which are more harmful than others. Um, and there are some we should all avoid, um, but creatures all respond in different ways to different types of fungi um, and so, it's variable, but quite a lot of creatures do. Okay. So let's have a look at the next question. So the next question says, is it not dangerous to rebuild artificially artificial food webs as it drastically disturbs the evolutionary process we are we all on earth are subject to? So yes, on one hand we would like to keep things as natural as possible because that's what's evolved over the years but it's that balance between having something or nothing so in some cases when we when the environment has been kind of but taken back to kind of the bare bones in the case of the quarry it's helpful to then reintroduce something rather than the, rather than nothing so although we would like to keep food chains and food webs as natural as possible because that's the balance that's what's keeping that Jenga tower balanced. Um, it is important that if we've taken everything away, we do start to bring some back. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's that kind of principle that although we like to keep things as natural as we can, um, there is gonna be a time where it's important to reintroduce species um, and that will kind of create that kind of artificial food chain in a way. Um, but it is something where it's important we introduce some species back when there has been none, basically. So let's have a look at the next one. Um, don't bird feeders favor some species and so affect migration patterns and reduce biodiversity? So there are pros and cons to a lot of things. So yes, on one hand, bird feeders are very good for feeding some local birds. Um, and that's very why well, they're very important. We always like to make sure we've given the birds as much food as possible. Um, so that's why it's very good to have bird feeders in your garden because it does attract more birds and make sure they've got the food they need to survive. But it's why it's very important to try and have a variety of feeders and a variety of food. So you can try and maybe search what birds you've got in your area and what, but what they eat. And then you can try and target your um, the food that you put in your um, bird feeders relevant to what those birds in your area need. And um, this will help the relevant species um, or the species in your area carry on to thrive and not target those that don't live there. And um, because there's so much food and so much kind of natural food that's lost due to the build up areas we all live in. Um, you think about it in kind of a lot of built up areas, there's very little food for birds. So any way that we can help is positive. Um, but if you make sure you do some research into the birds in your area, it can definitely help keep the food more specific. Okay, so let's have a look at the next question. So what is our human responsibility in balancing biodiversity when we had upset it by removing top predators? So, we not eat more venison cold from our countryside. Okay, so what is our human responsibility in balancing biodiversity? So it's very important that we do balance bio biodiversity. So it is up to us. If we're the ones that have disturbed it, we need to make sure we're kind of trying to replace it. 
um, if we want the world to kind of carry on, exist, like has been existing to carry on and provide us with the food and the environment that we need to survive, we have to make sure we support it. So there are lots of different ways to help support bi biodiversity, whether or not it's reintroducing as much as we can, these species that are now endangered, or um, a small level, so little things we can all do to help the local environment and our local creatures. Um, because the more balanced we keep biodiversity, the more resources there will be for the future and the longer we can all live. So, and the longer the human, human race can basically survive because we'll have the resources we need to carry on. Okay, so next question. Um, what is the greatest unknown in research on biodiversity and how can we reveal it? That's actually a very good question. I'm not really sure um, I'd know the answer specifically to that one because there are so many unknowns, really. There are so many creatures and species that we haven't even discovered yet that are deep in the ocean or in rainforests. And we may not even know some of the species that um, have been disrupted during deforestation. We may not even know some of those. For example, the deep sea is understood less than space. And you think about the vast expanse of space and how the deep sea is less understood than that. So there are so many things that we actually don't know still and so many species we have yet to discover. So it's really hard to know actually some of the impact that, we, that humans may have been having on these species when we don't even know everything that's out there. So it's quite a complicated question. There's a vast probably amount of answers to what the unknowns are. Um, so it's best that we, that as research continues, obviously we'll keep learning more, more and more. But at the moment, it's very important we just do what we can to help because without knowing everything, because it's very hard to know all the different aspects of biodiversity, but we can start to target the ones we do know about and try to figure out how we can help based on those. Okay, let's have a look at the next question. So one more question. Um, so thinking about farming, we mentioned how, um, you mentioned how farming was um, something that affected biodiversity. So what's some of the ways that, that farming can be more eco or more biodiverse friendly? Okay, so there are different ways to make farming more friendly. Um, and because a lot of farming, especially, um, especially in places like the Amazon, um, that the deforestation has happened for a variety of reasons. Um, soya farming is one of the biggest ones. Um, so some of the most harmful things are to do with monocropping or monoculturing, where you just have one type of crop on a piece of land. And that's quite harmful for biodiversity. So some of the ways we can help um, reduce that effect is by having different crops and crop rotations. By having more biodiversity on a plot of land, you can hopefully have less effect on the biodiversity in the area. Also, if you're thinking about grazing animals, if you move grazing animals around a field, you're not only helping the grass and the things they've been grazing on recover over time, but you're also helping spread the manure from those animals. And manure is actually really good at helping new things grow. So by getting that spread around the fields, you're helping new things to grow. So it's different types of um, farming that can definitely help. So you may be using smaller fields, um, because healthier, and this can actually produce healthier crops because there are organisms in hedges that help keep crops healthy. Um, and also another way to help is only buying food in their natural seasons to avoid, to reduce the demand for growing crops out of season. There's lots of different ways and there are actually some promising farms in the UK which are already implementing these ecosystems. Um, it is quite a hard task because um, there is, in a lot of times, an economic downside um, to these. So hopefully going forward, we'll start to see um, more money um, and more grants given to help um, farming become more eco and more biodiverse friendly. Um, and this can help encourage that kind of swapping around of land and swapping around of crops and having more bi biodiversity actually on the farm and help increase it in that way. I think that's about all the time we've got for questions today. I think, yeah, the session's about to end. Um, but thank you all very much for coming.
Um, and yeah, thank you all for answering questions. Um, and I hope you really enjoyed the session today. Um, I'm not sure how much longer um, there is. Um, but yeah, so I hope you really enjoyed the session today. There might be time for one more quick question, um, which is how should we prioritize research efforts on biodiversity? And again, that's something that is hard to judge. And it's something where the more research we do into biodiversity and the more research we do into the areas where it can be improved, um, the better it can be and the more we can learn. And the more we learn, the easier it will be to figure out all oh, that's different areas to focus on. And that can definitely help. So the more we learn, the easier it will be to kind of prioritize what we target in the future. So it's definitely a case of learning more. Okay, so that's great. Um, I hope um, any of you that answer questions, you um, I answered them all for you. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, and thank you very much for coming today.